Chapter 6. Holiness and Integrity. Love one another. Accountable. Office. Imparts sacred accountability. Accountability. That is registered to the specific soul, and to the specific office. We are all accountable in personal sense, and membership, such as the individual, and the citizen, in behavior, and thoughtfulness. We are also universally accountable to all good judgments, as morality, decency, humility, modesty, carefulness, brotherly love, and so on, as these, are universally inscribed upon our base consciousness, as being commanded, not suggested, I am holy, be thou holy also is not a religious suggestion, not a poetic reflection, it is the living nature of the holy essence of God, and the living call of all sentient entities to conform to that divine nature, as children of this Holy Spirit, as children, of the eternal God, personal accountability is that of our soul in the direct stance of our understanding, opportunities and restrictions in life, as privately, and jointly shared with God, according to our walk with God, the accountability of membership, is our state, within membership, being each specific office in the life we have, such as child, parent, teacher, brother, sister, preacher, missionary, governor, etc., in any combination, at any given time that we have them, by accountability, we are held responsible, wholly accountable, by God's living rule, bound, on a conscious and immaterial level, as spirits and souls, in regard to both self-awareness, and conviction, and to God, beyond all wisdom of our knowledge, our accountability to God, is not one we are aware of, as it is a judgment of the secrets of men not being hid from our own knowledge, as those truths we are all racked in, in every hour of the day, cradle, to grave, in regard to our accountability to God, we are warned only of our part in the matter, as I if our heart convict us, God is greater than our heart and Christ expands our knowledge, telling us, I if you have done it, you have done it unto me, stewardship, stewardship, is not at all a general or generic participation, but involved and intimate, being a live commitment in the spirit of membership. Stewards, are all members of each other, all members of the work, all the members are ultimately, universally, and irrevocably, called to their stewardship, by the internal gears of the heart and spirit, as it is a living bond within the family of Christ. Stewardship, is not a personal imagination, is not a fantasy of heart. It is not a private masquerade, it is the binding adoption of all within the Holy Spirit, to fulfill the ever alive will of God. By adoption, the Holy Spirit gives to each of us, a high sense of belonging, of belonging to each other, of belonging to Christ, of belonging to the work. We are the body of Christ. Stewardship, therefore, is the love of the brethren, which is not a mere stated commandment that was given to us, but a spiritual commandment that has been branded into our souls with fiery searing. The love of God, is an inescapable spirit, even in guilt and wrong, that defies our natural understandings of reality, and begs of us to exercise an active exclusion of selfish superiority from all thought and understanding, to ever, stand in the acknowledgement of the eternal unity of the Holy Communion, of all the saints, as alive and lively, to God, in Christ. The idea of ministry as being religious sermons and denominational missionaries has dominated centuries of Christian thought, and sentiment, partly, because of pride-filled religious elitists and evangelists, who serve themselves, their image, and their pocketbooks, partly, because our natural love, and due respect for our church fathers and elders, has been replaced with the misrepresentation that such affection and respect is wrong and sinful, partly because the entire truth of Christ, the Kingdom, the Eternal Father, and the Family of God, has been systematically eliminated from every sacred mention, display, and form of community, even, from the Holy Sabbath, entirely, because we have forgotten who God is, the Eternal Father, we have no relationship, we have removed faith, trust, and the Holy Spirit, from all sense of hope, meaning, and connection to the name of Jesus Christ and Jesus, we have forgotten, treating his person as if he is nowhere to be found, not recognizing, that he is absent in form, not in throne, he, is the head of the church, the eternal king, and the high priest, 
of the faith. Stewardship is not a servant going about to do a job for his master, not merely, not only, it is love, given to us by Christ, who God gave to us, and just as he was lifted up, that love that was first sent to us, we relive this sacrifice daily, because the love of God in us, and all our love, is lifted up, as Jesus was given up to God, we are given up to God, priests, after his order, stewards, of his love, shepherd, a shepherd, has a very engaging responsibility, that not only accounts them to each other, as brethren, but also to the safe and wise development of the flock, their primary job is to guard the sheep of Christ, from heresy, from apostasy, from the beguiling craft and works of satanic spiritual entities, a shepherd, has an incredible task, to maintain the purity of truth, the sacredness of devotion, the maturity of, the, faith, and the wisdom and the humility of the flock in its reverent, mindfulness of the eternal father, and his eternal Christ, shepherds, commit all their strength to the absolute battle against wolves, dragons, and every foul and dangerous predator that is set against the flock of God, shepherds, are guardian pillars over the church, ready to give life and limb always, who stand upon the rock of Jesus Christ, with the holy scepter, of the rod of God, as their integrity, counsel, and confidence, these humble beings are bold in faith, witness, and spirit, walking daily with God, like the unafraid shepherd, David, who stood watch over his master's beloved flock, they give account to a higher God, than anyone else, because their regard is the one, who rules over them, not the one the people decided was convenient to call God. The one, who is God, even when the people have forgotten his name, shepherds, do not fight for themselves, they fight for the sheep that belong to God, their own life, opinions, will, and wants are like those of any father or mother, set aside for the sake of their children, most shepherds are living martyrs, who die daily, the love of Christ is their curse, because it runs through their veins, just as it did John the Baptist's, who loving God's flock, became an outcast among all, that against the grains of religion and society, he, who should rightfully be a priest, became a lover of lost souls, and sought them in the wilderness of life, John, in holy love, met them in the field, not man's building, and heart to heart, he led them to Christ, and told them about eternity, in that kingdom of God, to come, and just before the greatest shepherd of all time was killed, he sent his fellow brethren to Jesus, to ask, art thou the one, or should we wait for another question mark, the shepherd, always serves God, always serves the one, who is higher than himself, we are all shepherds, and we serve Jesus Christ, the righteous one of God, preaching, and preparing the way, every valley shall be made low. Make the rough paths, smooth. Humble the soul, our God is one. We are called, we are, we are sent, flesh, cannot answer the call with which we are called, nor is it who or what we are, nor does it represent the will of Christ, it is the chariot in which the servants of Christ are carried about until that time, when they will receive a new vehicle for their spiritual entity, we are called, to good works, to righteousness, to renewed minds, a clean conscience before God, sufferings and sacrifices, in the tradition of Christ, as in, in the name of Jesus Christ lived, we are called to sure understanding, not as dribbling babes and dabbling toddlers, but in live communication of the heart and the soul and spirit, with the express essence of the eternal Father, the living truth, we are, the right hand of Jesus Christ, just as he is the right hand of the Father, in that we are called to never part his side, to be faithful, even to death, to be with him, in all trials and tribulations, in all proving, not as mortals wrung like clothes, we are born to serve the Christ, as faithful and certain, as belonging exclusively to the king's command, in this, we are first among all humanity, we are sent, to do all things, that we do in his name, as being done in his name, which is to say, we do these things, if they are holy to do, in his stead, so that we do them, as Christ, not replacing him, representing him, living, in his spirit, we are invested in the fields of our master, laborers over his possession, as servants sent into the field, as servants, 
sent by their king, to a land under his dominion, to secure what is his, to deliver what is given us to deliver, or to pronounce his decrees, as those sent to decree what the king has pronounced. Religion, is the end of godly trust. Religion, is beautiful, if it is the heart and earnest and goodness of way. Religion, is destructive to all existence and natural balance, if it is not the genuine affections of the heart, in humility and tenderness toward truth and God, where it is not a living extension of the soul, emotionally corded to its creator like a child asleep in the womb of its mother. Rather, it is a vain, soulless, habitual motion, and emptied of any holy communion between child and beginning, if it is not the living motion of the heart in relationship to the living glory of God. Religion that is godless, is the stealing devil of hope, and the crucible nail of death, to the heart's relationship with Christ. By it, we lose that relationship, turning away from our most intimate foundation, and leaving it behind, as we pursue whatever it is that religion or world would have us to do to be right with God, forgetting Christ, in his most beautiful essence, as our living right, to be with God. There is no truth, that a soul cannot feel. Just as there is no reality, to which the body is unaware, so that all mysteries outside these perceptions matter not, to the sense of awareness, and it is awareness, that empowers our sense, and sense, that makes all the relationships we have relevant to us, and if we have a relationship, then it must be sensed by the relevant awareness of our person to it, it is then a matter of private truth, that religion has no relevance upon the conscious nature of the person but as an exercise, that ought to exclusively, reflect the nature of the person, and if the nature, then the relationship of the person to their faith, our faith, is not meant to be replaced by religion or world, because it is based upon the power and fixed holiness of God, upon his person, as infinitely separate from all other considerations, so that self, who has only just appeared in reality, is likewise but a speck of sand somewhere outside the holiness of God, but not outside his, infinite, overall reach, the church too, is not meant to replace our faith, and though it has a live, and a practical spirit both, it ought always to exist as an extension of our faith, like a pen, in the hand of the writer, that alone, is nothing but a physical thing, but by the life of the writer, is turned into a vivid tool of expression, and an unequaled instrument of magnification, that magnifies the efforts, and wills, and spirits of the souls from whom it is empowered to operate, if given to Satan, the church becomes a mechanical bully, a soul-stealing institution of mental and emotional and human bondage, that channels all the energies of its slaves, and saps all genuine expression of want toward lively honor of the living God, and imprisons the heart of faith, behind blinding and restricting commandments, possessed. It insists against godly living, against godly charity, against godly giving, against godly honor. Possessed, it perverts all that is holy and sacred, with twisted and tainted versions, destroying the home, the family, and all God-anointed declarations of holy dot by carefully, and surgically, removing the heart away, from its acquisition of holiness, removing its heartfelt opportunities, the end of the church. In categorical dispensation, everything, is, is, according to an allotted time, according to a season, the earthly church, without Christ's immediate practical presence, exists in its own time, different from all other times, so that the millennial reign of Christ, will have a different form of the church, than it is now, as it is now, it exists until a fated, predetermined event, an event that cannot be stopped but that doesn't happen until the church violates the condition of its existence, which is to say, the inevitable is set, but, when it happens, is not set, known to God, yes, set by man's perspective, no, it is condition, Satan, will so fully control the church, that it becomes his in its greater state, unlocking the events of the end times, which are, till that moment, kept back by mutual agreement of holiness between those with the power to lose Satan, and God, when the church violates its commission, it invites Satan with open arms, no longer protecting the world or the flock from the ecclesiastical antichrist, it is the inevitable nature of man to transform the spiritual life of the church, into a mechanical, 
lifeless, image of the likeness of Lucifer, as that godless creature, with its godless followers, and godless city. The dark power of the church follows a massive fall to satanic influence, when it goes to war with God's divine son, seeking by word and doctrine and law to eradicate all holy mention of Christ, to persecute the pure, desecrate holy communion, and promote self-abasement, in all forms of lusts and selfishness, Babylon, nerve and fiber, of every single human, anywhere, rise in aches and ditches greatly with the instruction of Babylon propagating sentience over them, and surely and steadily, it writes its way into manifest form. Babylon, is the great instruction that sits in the back of man's mind. It is an image, that every being can see, a written manuscript, in the secret reaches of the conscious domain, that exiles the holiness of God, and replaces that holiness in every facet of life, with strategies, that logically calculate, in all lifeless formulas, the surest strongest, most certain maps of government and control, systematically, striving to secure the kingdom of man, as one, undivided, and ruled over power, but it must always have an enemy, or it cannot grow, so it conquers, or it is joined, and it must always have control, so it is paranoid, and policed, with strict command, and it must always have sheep, with a faint glimmer of hope, or it cannot maintain the people, so it has pleasure, and decadence, or government-controlled religion, it is a bloody beast, revelation, is not an intended reflection here, because the living church, and the spirit of God, and all the saints of the holy faith, are ever its enemies, not by their own election, but because the beast, cannot allow them to live, as their faith, is able to sow seeds of conscious division, that move through the empire like a fierce wave of faith in Christ that will seek every opportunity to pierce the walls of satanic control, and infiltrate the point hearts of whatever humanity is left, to the world and the fallen church, the followers of Jesus Christ, who are heart, soul, and spirit bound to the Holy Lord, are like rodents, invasive pests, who annoy and irritate and enrage the owner of the Babylon. Babylon, is determined to rise again, and it has never left, because her children are everywhere, and they will possess the world, by majority, perhaps, very soon, but even now, as ever, the roots of her hatred for the Son of God, have never left, as Jezebel, who slew the prophets of God, who is her image, and as all the images, that all the patterns show us, she too will stand in the end times, as the incarnate essence of her likeness, full of hatred for the prophets of God, Christ, is returning. Perspiration rains from the forehead of millions of gospel contradicting, socially beloved, preachers and vultures, who since the days following the birth of church change, work diligent whoredoms and mischief among the flock of God. How many got it wrong? There is one flock, there is one God, there is one gospel, there is one promise. Christ is the gospel, he, who is the promise of God, promised, since ever, promised, above ever, promised over ever, the sprinkling of the blood, that consecrates the souls entering ever, as clean, his throne, is eternal, man can do nothing to prevent this, Christ, is Lord, and he is returning, bringing heaven with him, his saints, his angels, his entire army, they will fill reality, like the blotting out of every light in the sky, Christ, is, shall always be, and ever, will reign, as Lord, Master, King, an undeniable God, his throne is over all the creation of God, over all the heavens combined, irrevocably sealed in the promise of God, the church, is not an organism of like minds, that say Jesus is Lord, it is not an institution of organized efforts and doctrines that surround a common and unanimous belief that he rose from the dead, promised to fly people away, or keep them from the fires of hell, the church, is not vain and selfish such as all the doctrine and beliefs and views that promise gifts to men for belief and good behaviors. The church, is the solitary spirit of all on earth, who believe without apology, that Christ is the sovereign Son of God, that he is absolutely everything the living God, has ever sworn he is, as beyond all mortal understanding, selfish beliefs, and private esteem. Jesus Christ, is not a child's game, 
He is not a soft and cuddly thought. He cuts. He wounds. He maims. He destroys. He is that terrible king, of the mighty God, the wrath of the eternal vengeance. He slices through flesh and men without effort, crushes Satan, and heaven, like mountains of diamond, turned instantly to dust. He is the sure end of all liberties, the end, of all freedoms under God, the end, of all revelry and dance, the end, of all things opposed to God. There is none like him, none before him, none, to survive him. The cosmos tremble like a nervous pig before him. The pigs in them, quake with terrible fear. There is nowhere to hide. Nowhere to escape the soul. Nowhere to store the heart. Nowhere the flesh will flee. Nothing, will escape. His forceful fury will overtake the quickest and the mightiest that creation has to offer. Let the giants of existence boast. They all will lose their heads. He, is destined to his crown. Destined to his victory destined to wear creation like a king wears a ring. It is a mere trinket, nothing, without its king. He, is coming here, let heaven and earth fear. He will slay the armies of Satan, annihilate the armies of man, rule all, with absolute subjugation beneath his throne. Thy footstool, O God, prepare. We are ill prepared for the day of the Lord, partly, in ignorance, not knowing Christ, or who, in what truth, power, and eternal essence, he is, and is, him, and because we have never seen him in more than our fluffy, self-worshipping, imagination, because we believe how good we think we are, we prepare ourselves for tragedy of heart, our face off with Christ, as facing pure live, all-knowing, truth, standard of God, is but one moment, yet, the consequence of this encounter is eternal, yet, eternal is something we cannot sense or see or feel, and are too stupid to fear. Few, in all of history, were prepared for this day. The apostles themselves, trembled with quake and tears for the day they would stand before the eternal, of the eternal, knowing how impure and inopportune and lazy every mortal soul is. When faced with the pure truth of truth, how shall we skip through this life, that is not even life, so careless and childish and self appeased and not dread judgment with reverent want for some better thing from ourselves, not as religious perfections, but in the sincerity of honest judgments, efforts, compassions and concerns, in the mindful meditation of what the Spirit gives us, that we can improve, if even a little, turning our hearts, even slightly, toward God, with the affections and gifts of our soul, there is not much in life we have, yet, the soul is the child of its spiritual parent able to bless the heart of its parent, with such simple things as a little gesture of love, so small and pathetic a thing, that no one, except the child's parent would understand the gift with love and wonder. God, cannot wonder at anything, except his child's love. Christ, will render to God, all that belong to him. He will bring to the Father, all those precious children that belong to the Father, every one of them, a magnificent event of wonder to the Father a brilliant glowing wonder in his heart. There is nothing in existence, more important than this one gift to God, his child's love. Yet, that a single saint, in all of existence has existed, and claimed the victory of Christ, through their faith and faithfulness, is enough to condemn the entire world beneath them. Yet none fear, even the simplest of saints. Brethren, we are not in competition. There is none among us worthy of such exaltation that we should forget we all belong to Jesus Christ, in equal humility and lowliness. None are our teachers, but all, if they be taught of God, are taught of the Holy Spirit, each, according to their walk, each according to their faith, each, according to their faithfulness or lack of it, and all, according to the wisdom of God. We are not above the Holy Spirit, not the masters of the Word of God, not the wise men of existence. But each, is a low character, a soul, adrift in the lone ocean of life, under a dark, starlit night, trusting upon God, for our redemption. We are fellow heirs of each other's salvation, as family, not opponents, as brothers and sisters, and those, of Christ, not as competing enemies, not as rival salesmen, standing on different street corners, shouting this great thing or that, looking to wow or win a crowd hoping to sell the majority of the wares. We are Christ's property, 
How shall we compete? It is pride, more often than integrity, that sets the brethren at each other, like snapping dogs, trying to win some measure over their brother. We belong to the truth, not to pride. There should be only truth among us, held in love, brothership with Christ, and integrity of service. We should quiet our pride, embolden our integrity, present Christ, seek peace, in diligent humility, knowing the family of Jesus Christ, but never, 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 accept spiritual compromise, never, compromise the gospel, never, let the seed of such a sin be planted, in any attempt for peace, as it will spread its corruption faster than any stroke of the pen, whole crops will be lost, not a shepherd among them, generations, will disappear in error, each, worse than the last, like possessed swine, charging the cliff's edge, to fall to their death, union, we are called by one spirit, to one fellowship, in synchronous piety, humility, and joy of being, we are spiritually alert to our membership, instilled with an unalienable sense of our Christ family, man, is a different creature than the church, with a different judgment, we are the redeemed, washed, in the blood of Jesus Christ, called to the living city of the Holy Spirit, to the live body of Christ, as being called to, from out of all the world, each generation takes our place, as we all in like fashion stand the earth in Christ's own stead, and all the church holy, will see its reward in Christ, our faulty sense of time, persuades our senses against this, encouraging materialistic worship, and sensual purpose, forbidding our knowledge of Christ, that eternal moment that will cut all from its temporal cord, and make every speck of time and material stand in perfect humility, naked, and vulnerable with exposure, as all reality squares off with the overshadowing might of the endless living God, our spirit is brought into unanimous union of the knowledge of the eternal power of the eternal King, that eternal God, declared to reign over all forever, and ever, the Holy Spirit, has impressed this knowledge into our hearts and souls, and we share the common humility of everything that knows before the day, to fear the moment of Christ, when all liberty is gone forever, when all rebellious mischief and choice are taken from the slightest chance of possibility, forever, when all, is in unanimous holy union, then, forever, while now, we are called to holy communion, by the spirit of holy peace, the mystery of the church, in translation, in earnest, the church looks up in its heart, waiting for a spiritual reunion with Christ. No one knows the hour. No one knows the day. Jesus said, only the Father knows, that the Father, would send the Christ, when he decided the time was right, and that, if the owner of the house knew in what watch of the night the thief would appear, he'd be sure to be awake at that hour. The church was founded on Jewish understandings and history, embraced Gentiles, raised in pagan worships all their lives, neither of whom, Jew or Gentile, fully understood the mysteries of all they held, by securing in Jesus Christ, all the promise of God holy, it was divided in many early thoughts, needing to be fixed and edified often, this was one of the great tasks of the apostles, the return of Christ for his church, was one of those confusions, many thought he would appear as a man again, found in this place or that, teaching, as he had done, to which the apostles addressed, stating the following, Christ would not return, until that Antichrist first appeared. The Antichrist, who is the incarnate Satan, would not appear until the great apostasy, a time, when the church had all but lost her faith entirely, being in the state of no longer knowing Jesus Christ, in passion, or truth or body, or Holy Spirit. The great apostasy, church side of the end times, is the first event in the series that leads toward the return of Jesus Christ. Its hour gives rise to Satan, as he is loosed by the unfaithfulness of the church, and with it, is the hour that none may work as the apostate church, author's interpretation, who first praises the Antichrist as God, is after destroyed by him, hunted like animals, the bodily form of the faith on earth, author's interpretation, will forget their God, who Christ is, and the sheep are scattered to the winds of their own ways so that barely any would know the certainty of the majesty and the deity of the eternal Son of God. The faith itself, goes into the wilderness, surviving in the hidden places of the hidden heart of man, where this man or that woman in all a place, alone, 
shall carry the weight and burden of the faith, in soul-poured prayer, in the deepest depths of praise and fellowship with God, in whatsoever acceptable sacrifices put upon them by the Eternal Father. The world will not know the spirit that guides the Holy Church, of the Holy Faith, it will not sense the force that moves through these saints of Jesus Christ, who give their lives, and their testimony, and by it, condemn the world, sealing its fate, as beneath them at the return of God's glory. But we, who remain, will not prevent them who have died for Christ. The physical remnant will not stop the dead in Christ from rising in translation, as the church whole, must first be translated, and then that kingdom come. Not all will be killed, not all will die, but all will be set, sealed, and destined. When Jesus Christ returns, all will be translated into that glory that awaits them. First, the dead shall rise, and we, straightway after, will be called forth, we and our bodies translated into that new thing, and this, before the kingdom of Jesus Christ shall take hold of all the earth. And here, we see the prophet's words, how that Christ shall come with ten thousands of his saints, and the words of Daniel also to take all the kingdoms of the world, and subject them under Christ, in absolute rule, and the new kings of the world shall be the glorified saints, who rule with their king, as that mystery of God, made higher than the angels, even higher than the holy celestial angels, in this Christ warns, do not glory in that powers and principalities are subject to you, but that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life, we must be very careful, because, we don't own the faith, Nothing compares, nothing matters, nothing is, nothing replaces. There is one God, the living eternal Father, who bound all, if they cared or not, beneath his Son, the eternal Christ, and accused all of needing his Holy Spirit, in order to be his, eternal with him, and ever among him in adopted form. Man has a peculiar way of omitting both truth and obligation. He calls it free will, and with free will, he invents belief, faith, and all religious applications, all of which are entirely vital to his being, in the most sincere recognition of being the platform of his conscious relationship to reality. However, it is the disconnected association he has through them, as passively, apathetically, carelessly, setting any truth of them to the side, and acting upon the whole realm of reality as personal entertainment, servant to him, and his to dismiss any way he sees fit. In the guise of free will thinking, the particular truth is always factually binding, essence, substance, relationship, and consequence that we cannot escape, no matter how free we are to willfully pretend they are not both imposing and obligating. Truth obligates us, because we belong to it. It is the reason a man is guilty, even if he believes himself innocent. It is the power that takes a man to the grave. No matter how resistant he is to being controlled, it is the reason nations crumble before God, who shook their heads in laughter at the thought of God coming against them. It is the reason the universe will fall before Christ, because truth has spoken it. God has said it. Our faith as a man, is in everything, from family to employers to the next day. And this is the unearned faith of a man. His presumption, God, promised Christ. Christ, shall reign. Reality shall be enslaved to the Holy Spirit of his kingdom, and all shall be remade in his glory, given entirely to the Spirit of the Highest. This no man can believe, presume, or expect, except, that by faith they trust that God the Eternal, has said it, and if he has said it, then he shall do it. In this, we, the Church, apart from all others, have placed our faith, and in this faith, we are obligated to the Spirit of Truth not at all in a sense of free will, yet, as to ever, being made an entity, that is obligated to a spirit, in such faith, all the spirit of the church is married to the word of God, as one spirit, to another spirit, in this, all other marriages of spirit and Christ, are explained, the church does not own the faith, it does not own Christ, it does not own the promise of God, it does own the rewards of the saints, it does not own the redemption to come, it does not own the eternity to be had. It does not own the rest of God. It does not own the good news of salvation. It does not own the resurrection of the dead. It heralds, being witnesses, by faith. It is obligated, as witness, herald, and servant, 
to all that is promised man and God. We are a nation of priests who serve the word of God, not as minions reciting scripture night and day, but as stewards who take to life and heart all truth that is promised in the everlasting breath of the Father, spoken to us by Christ through his Holy Spirit. We belong to God. Nothing true is an object for man to approach with free will and omission. It stands over his head without hands to hold it up forever even in the days of ever fight the good fight of faith christian spirit is made complicated by the frustration of two natures dueling each other in every aspect of our lives a duel that is no easy thing to live with our soul is born again in jesus christ we go forth in the name of jesus christ our love flows through the holy spirit in the holy spirit we can overcome the adversary of our day taking back from the devil those he has stolen by his warfare and camouflage deceits. Love is why the church exists. It is why the church is. Without love, the church fails. Without love, the adversary wins. Lack of love is why the church fails. Because without it, there is no natural sense of family. It is as a broken home, with each going this way and that, family by name, but each a stranger in their own home. Love the brethren. Love the brethren, not as men and women, not as human beings, as children of God, born in the light of creation. In Jesus' name, in the everyday world of the Christian, there are victories and there are losses. And these, in far excess to anything natural man can understand, as we are progressing toward a mark, seeking, beneath God, to respect the eternal Christ, in all that he is most surely worthy of, with our deepest respects, and in our earnest effort. What we face in life is cruel, not fair, and unknown to others. And in this, every Christian, even husband and wife, are different. Loving the brethren, is not only the affectionate care of knowing they are brethren, but also the mutual love, of knowing they are brethren, respecting them, and knowing, that we all face such a strong adversary, that none of us meets the same fight the same way. And while we are all called to righteousness and good works, there are occasions in all our lives, that we don't live up to our call, that we are defeated, and need encouraging. There are battles, that some can win with ease, that others, might never win, that some will take to the grave. It is not enough to love and emotion, we need to also love and deed, helping with the necessities of each other, and love each other with equal respect, knowing, that it might be simple for some of us to face this crisis, or that vice but it might take everything out of someone else, and they are our brother or our sister in Christ, just as we are, theirs, we edify the soul, we call the spirit to Christ, and we encourage the faith of each other, not in judgment, but in loving affection, grace, and tender memory of the kingdom that awaits, and the eternal king, to whom we all call our hope and our salvation and our redemption, love, is not about forgetting problems, it's about facing them, not in a sense of control or contest, but in a sense of brotherly bonds, each to each other, and each other to Christ, as together, in the Holy Spirit, and in the Holy Spirit, in all heavenly love, pray for each other, always, not seeing the flesh, but seeing the needs of the soul, that we all have, for all faithfulness, for all holy wisdom, for endless strengthening of the Holy Spirit and bountiful blessing of our holy walk with God, and pray for the gospel, that all over the world, the heart will hear the words of the Spirit of God, and believe his promise of Christ, love, with endearing, tenderness, ferocity, and care, building, strengthening, supporting, and remembering by this love, this kind of love, different from all earthly passions, the eternal essence of our dearly precious and most beloved God, the eternal Father forever. Our Father, Eternal.